Welcome friends and family. We're so happy to invite you today to beautiful Honey Lake Clinic. I just have some awesome news for you. We've had such an exciting month. This month we're opening up our Shalom program, which is the only program in the world, a Christian program in the world for those folks struggling with psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective. We also just opened up our adolescent female program, young ladies 13 to 17. But what I'm really excited about is to announce to you the opening of our program to the military. Uh, we all love our military, all the sacrifice, all the service. And so starting at the end of this month, we are starting our military program. Uh, they will be able to use their TRICARE insurance to get uh, services here at Honey Lake Clinic. And I'm especially pleased today to introduce you to the gentleman who's going to be running that program, uh, our new director of military services, uh, Chaplain James Johnson. Welcome, James. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here. We're, we're so happy to have you here. Um, I haven't uh, spent a lot of time with you, but the time I've, I've, I've spent with you, I've just been so impressed by your character. Um, you're just such a, you seem like such a consistent person. And uh, we're, we're honored to have you as part of the family here at Honey Lake Clinic, you and your wife. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself. You're, you're a local boy. You were, you were uh, born here in, uh, in Madison County. But tell us about your growing up years. Where were you born? What did your parents do? Yes, sir. I, I was born um, in Rifle, Colorado, but um, my family wanted to relocate back here because uh, we had our extended family. Was your father military as well? Yes, sir. Oh, he, he was. was. Okay. He was in the Air Force. And did you travel all over the United States or all over the world or where? Um, I know that we spent some of our time in, in Egypt when I was very little. I don't okay. remember any of it. Um, and then we came back over to the States and okay. then he, he was stationed in Arizona for a while and then um, Colorado and then we, when he got out of the military we came back over here. So your, your folks were originally from this area? Yes sir. So um, growing up here in Madison, what was that like? Um, you know, kind, kind of like what you see in the, in the you know, TV shows. I feel kind of like this is Mayberry and the Andy Griffith show that um, everything's slower, everything's um, kind of behind the times in a lot of ways, but that's also good. You know, you build a lot of great relationships and families and uh, we grew up in you know, a farming community, very you know, uh, agrarian here and it's, it's kind of everybody knows everybody, but uh, everybody is willing to help everybody too. So it's, it's been a, a wonderful upbringing here. Okay. Are your folks, were they Christians? Or? Oh yes, sir. I have a very, very strong. Uh, my mother played piano in the church, so I, I've been in I've been in the church since before before birth. So um, you you grew up here, Matt? Did you attend private school, Christian um, school? Uh, no, sir. I, I attended the public school here, yeah, all the, all the way through. Um, you know, I went from from preschool all the way to high school graduation. Uh, you know, Madison only has a, a couple of choices, only one choice for high school. So when I was growing up, so we all knew each other, and that was kind of nice. Were you active in the church growing up? Or? Oh yes, sir. I was. Um, I'm blessed to have, um, you know, my family was, was plugged into church and my uh, parents decided, you know, when I, I got close to middle school and high school to um, move to a church with a, a great youth program. And so I was mentored by my, my great buddy, Jackie Watts, uh, who's now a senior pastor of, of a church community. But he mentored me and um, really helped me find my path as I, I felt the call to ministry and, and, and listened to that call. And while I was in school to, um, to do all of that, he, was, he and, uh, was always a, a great supporter and mentor of mine. So your dad was in the military. Did you grow up wanting to be in the military? Oh, yes, sir. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, and my wife got, got tired of hearing, my, my plan was to, as soon as I got out of high school, was to join the military and uh, tried to pursue my, my music ambitions uh, for a while. And once we, that had kind of run its course, my wife told me I had time to either fish or cut bait. I either need to join up or, or quit talking about it. And, and so that was 12 years ago, and we've, we've been enjoying it ever since. So tell us about, the, after you graduated from high school, what did you do? Um, I moved to, to Tallahassee and went to Florida State uh, for my undergraduate degree. Um, and then my original plan was to be an event coordinator. Um, but when we uh, came back to Madison, when my wife and I got married, we wanted to come home, what we felt like was coming home to a smaller town and um, to have our family here, that um, there really wasn't much work for um, for event coordinating. And, and so uh, since she's an elementary school teacher, the, the principal knew me and, and he needed a, another teacher and said, hey, why don't you go back to school and, and we'll hire you. And so I did night classes in education and uh, fell into teaching and then I stayed there for 16 years. And it was it was a whole lot of fun. So so you 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 graduated uh, from from uh, FSU. Mm -hmm. I think you said you got a degree in leadership. Yes, sir. OK. And then um, had you been involved in the military, like through ROTC or anything like that? So just no experience, really? No, sir. So you got out of, co out of college, under your undergrad, and then you started teaching? Yes, sir. So then when you were 26, you finally said, okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and sign up. And um, so where, where did you serve? 
Um, so when I, when I uh, first joined up, I enlisted. Um, just wanted to do a few years and get out just to kind of do my part. I, I did human resources work. Um, but while I was in there, the, the people started, you know, realizing that um, I, I enjoyed talking to me. Said, "Oh, you know, you're, they found out I was in ministry in the civilian world." And they said, "Yo, you should be a chaplain. You should be a chaplain." Wow. And um, the way that, at least in the army, they they have a program called the Chaplain Candidate Program. Mm -hmm. And so what they will do is, while you're in school, um, getting your graduate degree, because you, you have to have a, um, at least a um, a master's degree to become a chaplain uh, in the military. And so while you're in school, you can become an officer and train under another chaplain. And I had a great supervisory chaplain who, who took care of me and showed me how to find that balance between being a good army officer and being a great minister to your soldiers. And once, um, once I, I started, it was, I, was, I was sold. So what, um, did you attend seminary or, okay. And was it an MDiv or a master's degree? Yes, so I got, um, uh, got a master's of divinity from Liberty University. Okay, that's a great school. I'm, I'm a Liberty graduate as well. In fact, I was up there this last week. Oh, wonderful. Doing a lot of exciting things collaborating with Honey Lake Clinic. So um, you've got a master's of a divinity. So, I mean, you study the Greek and the Hebrew and all that. Wow, that's, that's usually, a, a, that can be a five to seven year program. Yes, sir. And, and so then once you graduated, you became a full-time chaplain. Um, yes, sir. So, uh, well, I stayed in the reserve, so I was, I was still teaching and, and um, you know, but doing the, uh, I've always been a reserve chaplain outside of when they, um, when I was deployed. Okay. So explain to me, and I'm sure there's some other people out there, can you list in the reserves or you do some time in the military and then you become a reserve or how does that work? Uh, yes, sir. So, so in the, you know, uh, um, originally when they first started doing the reserves, that's what they wanted you to do was spend some years active duty and then they kind of, to keep you in, enticed to stay in, they would offer you to be in the reserve so you could earn a retirement. Um, but for a while now, they've allowed you to just be, you know, in the, in the reserves and that be your obligation. Okay. Um, and, and that, you know, allows you to, to go to college or have a civilian career and, and stay local without having to, to relocate every three or four years. Now, I know, I know before you were called the Honey Lake Clinic here recently, you were overseas for almost 10 months. Is that yes, correct? Sir. Now, was that your first deployment? Um, I, I did a, um, a short one-month overseas training mission um, in 2018 to Germany and Poland, which was a wonderful opportunity. But, um, you know, like I said, that was just a month. And so it was, it was a great learning experience. But the, the long-term deployment, that was my, my, that was my first time really being gone for that long. So um, where were you deployed on the 10 months? Um, I spent um, nine of my of, of the so we spent one month gearing up and, and getting ready to, to go, um, and then we spent nine months out of country, and I spent eight months in Kuwait um, at a base. Uh, uh, I was a hospital chaplain uh, for the um, for the only Roll Three uh, clinic in that part of the of the theater of the the, the um, Army Central Command that was there, and then I got to spend a month in Jordan uh, being pushed forward to, to to work with soldiers that were kind of out in the in the further reaches of the of the combat area. Then you came back from your, your deployment. Now, that was just recently, right? Yes, sir. I came back. I um, actually, actually came back in country um, in uh, the middle of September, um, toward the end of it. And then you have, um, because of, of, of the you know, coronavirus, we have a, um, the, the, you have to out process and go through medical and all that kind of stuff. And then we had to quarantine. So I actually got home on the 1st of October. So that was really cool. You know, as, as, as I sit here and, and listen to your story, James, you know, my father uh, has, has built ministries all over the world. <clears throat> And the most consistent prayer he prays is, is Lord, send workers um, because the harvest is ripe and the workers are, are few. And I just sit here and listen to your testimony. And, you know, our, our, our vision that we know the Lord has given us to, to catalyze a Christ-empowered behavioral health revolution to the, to the world, um, it, it's such a huge job. And, you know, it's, it's way beyond any of us, right? And, but when I see the type of people that God has prepared, um, you and your wife and your family, uh, you know, we, we love our military. Uh, we know the sacrifices they make. I, I grew up most of my life in, in Beirut, Lebanon, and, and very familiar with that part of the world, very dangerous. You know, th these, these families, these servicemen, we know they want to come back and be the, be, be the fathers uh, to their children and the, and, the, and the husbands to their wives and be the leaders in the community, the churches. But they've experienced so many things, you know, that, that we here civilians just can't even begin to imagine. And I'm sure you guys that have been over there have stories to tell that we, we, we can't even begin to understand or, or relate to. That's why we're so excited about you coming here, because we want to relate to you. Mm -hmm. We want to share your suffering. We want as brothers and sisters to gather around you and love you and your family. And, and bring healing to these guys. But uh, we're gonna take a short break and we're gonna come back and I wanna talk about some of these different aspects of treatment, okay? Absolutely, yes sir. Friends, we'll be right back. 
Hi, my name is Lauren and I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. Everybody has a story to tell. I come to Honey Lake because I was thinking that my end of my story was, it was just gonna end in suicide. And I had realized that over 10 years, I had thought of myself as an abused victim from an abusive relationship. But it turns out that I am a human trafficking survivor. My mom had done research this past episode that I had of feeling suicidal, and she decided that I look into Honey Lake. Um, but this is a facility that is literally a one-of-a-kind experience. There's not any like it in this nation. At Honey Lake, I have received so much treatment. One of the most amazing experiences I've had is EMDR. EMDR is something that has biblical truths built into it, and it takes negative experiences and begins to shape your mind into a way that where you think, where is Jesus in this? And you start to see how um, God is going to shape your story and what you need to do to accomplish your, your divine design. And it's just an amazing experience because it taps me into this mindset of my trauma and it releases me. And that brings me to another point of being included in worship here. And that has been part of my healing here at Honey Lake. I've been able to sit in with incredible musicians and honestly, it just shifted my mood. I, I've, instead of turning inward to myself, I was able to go outwards and praise God. And I looked at my circumstances from totally different eyes from that point on. Another thing that I got out of Honey Lake was um, the art therapy through different things like painting, like there's tons of paintings that like I've done and doing like little bracelets. Here's a bracelet that I made yesterday and just simple joys. And like we're talking while um, we go through, talk about what we interpret our art to be. And in this case with my bracelet, it was um, the patterns, my patterns in life and that I can change my pattern. I'm internally like moving through art and getting really creative with my healing process. Dee um, is a person here that is incredible, just health wellness coach. She is just a gem here. Um, I did a 5K while being here. It was the first 5K that I ever done. And um, I got third place, which I'm very proud of. And Dee does um, nature walks that I really, really enjoy. Um, getting back into nature and um, just feeling God's presence through that. Another thing that I liked, the equestrian horses are really amazing experience. Um, I was able to get out on the trails. I love animals and there is some pet therapy here. So that's been a treat. Overall, Honey Lake has been an incredible experience. I am so fortunate to have been able to attend here. It felt like I was getting my faith back again. Welcome back, friends. I know you're super excited as I am about the topic for the day, and that's the introduction of our new military program here at Honey Lake Clinic. And James, we're just so excited about this program. Uh, you know, each one of our programs here at Honey Lake Clinic is geared specifically to that demographic, whether it's adolescent females or, or mood disorders or psychotic disorders. Um, but the military comes with very special needs. Uh, we're especially looking at developing this program around uh, diagnoses like PTSD, depression, anxiety. You know, PTSD and the symptoms of PTSD, those symptoms are almost what make a good soldier. I mean, one of, the, one of the symptoms of PTSD is someone that is highly vigilant mm -hmm. and, 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 and can't sleep or is always hypervigilant, right? It's also someone that's defensive, but also anger. Mm -hmm. Anger makes a good soldier, right? Um, you, you have to have that emotion. We know that, that, that anger is always a manifestation of fear. Mm -hmm. And probably if you're out in the battlefield, it's probably a good idea to live with a little fear. Mm -hmm. But if you, could you just share with us some of the 
maybe one or two of the most of the stories that really impacted you the most? Absolutely. Um, one of the ones I had, I had the privilege of working with the um, Combat Operational Stress Control Unit that partnered with the hospital I worked with, um, and there, were, there was a, um, a, a rocket attack in, in one of the bases, um, and what ended up happening was they got the call for it super quick, and they only had a short amount of time uh, to get in uh, behind the barriers, and a lot of the barriers were not um, the right ones because they had to get to them so quickly, and so they uh, dealt with a lot of concussions, a lot of traumatic brain injury, a lot of, um, you know, just fear. Of, of having to move, like you said, very quickly. Um, and so when that came back, they had a lot of people that were dealing with the repercussions of experiencing that, seeing it, you know, firsthand. Um, you know, a lot of times when, uh, we, you know, we, we train and we train and we train. And, and, and thankfully, the vast majority of people in the military don't experience that, but when it happens, it happens so quick um, that they they have a uh, don't have a whole lot of time to process it. And so, getting to, to work with them and, and do the uh, you know, the debriefing and the and the you know sensing sessions with all that, and try to say Let, let's talk through what you saw and what you went through, and, and working with that cognitive rehabilitation was a great privilege of mine. Even though I hated seeing the stress and the struggle that a lot of people went through because of that, and it was just it was just so fast. You know, when it finally happened, that was the thing that surprised me the most about you know modern warfare is it's not like we studied in the textbooks, you know, when we were going through history class where you saw the enemy coming, you had time to prepare, you had time to get ready for the engagement. A lot of times these things happen, you know, a lightning bolt. Yes, sir. It's like a car accident. That's right. you, don't, you, you can't even prepare for it. That's right. So when you're, when you're dealing with that kind of trauma in a hospital, now I'm sure you were in a hospital, there was probably, um, you know, uh, medical issues, people, you know, legs blown off That's and all right. those kind of things we expect in war. Was, was there a separate area for the psychiatric aspect of, of, of trauma? Um, and so we were uh, what's called a roll three. So we saw people and kind of stabilized them and then sent them further to Launchdale, Germany. And so we would get them very quickly, um, but I was also thankful for the time I get to spend with those patients before they get sent forward. A lot of people, you know, struggling with trauma, struggling with, with suicide, struggling with depression. Uh, a lot of younger soldiers that were n not trained and not geared towards being away from home, from being away from those, um, you know, those things that, that give us hope and meaning. And that was one of the things that, you know, you combine that with um, a lot of the, the isolation of the struggles of, of being away from home and away from the things that uh, we normally engage with on a regular basis that help fill our lives. It, it, it creates a lot of, of darkness and depression for soldiers. So on top of the combat aspect, even in a day-to-day -day life, just being away from home, being sure. away from familiarity, um, being isolated and, and, and forced off, that, that caused a lot of behavioral health issues with soldiers as well. Um, so, so where you were, it was most triage they were they were coming in and and it's more of a stabilization right. type right. level of care so uh, when, when it came to the psychological the psychiatric What's the what's the length of stay they would stay at that hospital out there in the Middle East? Um, it, it could be anywhere from from two to three days to two to three weeks. Um, it just depends on one of the problems that we had uh, for a while uh, because of COVID was getting permission to get them out of country. Uh, during a, during a few months while we were there, it seemed almost impossible to get some of these patients out. So for them, it, it could end up being over a month before they could get out. Yeah. Now, as a chaplain, or I mean, did, did you receive any special training to work with these traumatized shoulders? Um, so one of the blessings that I had, um, you know, with, with my, my degree was actually in a military chaplaincy when I did my graduate degree. Uh, so I got training there, and I also had the ability to, to be a hospital chaplain. Um, you have to be, you have to take um, hospital training over here in the States. And so that was, when I was there, those were my three big focus areas was emergency medicine, oncology, and the, the intensive care. So when I was there, I worked a lot with um, people that were, were dealing with those massive traumas and walking through with them. So as far as that goes, I was prepared for that. What was surprising was how different it was when it's not just a regular patient that you meet in the hospital, when it's actually another brother or sister in arms. And, and that, that was surprising as to how different it felt uh, treating them because it, it, just, it just carried more weight yeah. to me. That's a, another dynamic we need to talk about. You know, I've, I've read so many studies and, you know, here in the United States and Western, uh, you know, the Western culture, we're, we're capitalists, we're individualistic, we're independents. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, independence, you know, that cowboy pioneering spirit is, is a part of who we are. But really the military is not about me, it's about us, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and, and really for the soldiers to come together, you know, it, it's amazing to me, but there's, there's a lot of studies to show that that egalitarian culture um, is really very attractive to most people. They'd rather share life and share experiences. You know, I can remember reading a study as far back as, 
as uh, Native American Indians and some of the cavalry that were captured by the Native American Indians. And when the cavalry would come back and rescue them, many of them did not want to return to Western culture because that Indian culture was so much more us as opposed to me that they, they had become grown into that culture and, and become a part of it. Like for instance, with the Indian culture, probably similar to the military culture, you didn't have a lot of possessions because you were basically, you were moving all the time. I mean, you, you had your teepee and you had your horse and, and so there weren't rich people or poor people. Everybody was sort of on the same level. And, and, and I've read and understood that a, a, a huge dynamic in, in PTSD is, is just not, you know, the hell of war, but also soldiers that get used to that lifestyle mm -hmm. and then come back to a culture here in the United States where it's each man for himself, really, right. kind of a thing. Could, could you, what, what does that look like? Uh, well, you know, and, and that was where, um, you know, and, and thankfully, you know, in, in modern days, we, we do have a lot of creature comforts that, you know, might not have existed during World War II in Vietnam, you know, you know with, with um, you know, internet and electricity and air conditioning and stuff. But, you know, one of the things that really does happen is you end up sharing in the suffering of other people that you are you camaraderie with and you have, um, and especially in some of these, these forward pushed out areas to like Afghanistan and Iraq and, um, you, know, you know, some of these other countries that uh, we, we've reached out into where you are, you you know, like you said, you're you're share and share alike. That we share our meals together, we share our sleeping areas. Share guns together. together. That's right, and and that ends up creating a bond that um, a lot of people really miss when they come back. And and thank thank goodness for for social media, that's a big help. Um, and reunions, that's a big help. But for a lot of our a lot of our soldiers when they come back, you know, and, and service members that they they built this camaraderie and they've been together for nine, ten, sometimes twelve, fifteen months, mm -hmm. and they come back. And not only is the landscape different, is that you know you've got a lot more luxuries, you've got a lot more, you know, technically safety, but you are no longer with those people that you share that in common with, and it can be very isolating. You can even be surrounded by people that really do care for you, but you can't receive that care because they, they haven't kind of earned that place at the table to share in your suffering with you like the other people have. I, I tell people often, you know, trauma is not what happens. Trauma is what the brain perceives as happening. Mm -hmm. You know, God wires our brain for connection, right? And when we experience trauma, it rewires for protection. So we start putting up all these inappropriate soothing mechanisms, defense mechanisms, anger being one of them, uh, drinking being a soothing mechanism. But, but really, you know, so, so you have, you know, I mean, so vets that have, you know, had their legs blown off in an IED mine um, that are fine. And then you meet some kid, you know, 26 year old kid that tripped on his shoelace so going over a curve and it's, it's like, it's, it's like the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So, so when we, when we talk about trauma and mi ministering to the military, we're, we're talking about different aspects of trauma, right? right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're obviously talking about, you know, being in a, in a foxhole with bullets whizzing over your head and having your, your, your best friend shot. That's right. But also we're talking about these, these, these guys returning back to the United States after spending so much time in that environment and, and really coming back to a different planet. That's right. And, and, and having those people that were the closest to you when you left maybe not even understand 50% of what's going on in your life right now. Can, can you share some of that and how, what are some tools that, that can be used to reacclimate those guys, or, or females, back, back into, the, into, into society? Absolutely, and, and you know, you, br you bring up a lot of great points that one of the things that um, I think, you know, because we are such a, we, and we are, we're a wonderfully patriotic country, you know, I, I thank God that I, I've served in a time where unlike, um, you know, previous generations where, you know, the country did not embrace the servicemen and women that right. have, have gone through that, that, you know, we came home and, you know, it was, it was so cool to see people, when I met my family in the airport, you know, it was so cool to see people, other people cheering and being part of that, um, but it was, it was one of the wonderful things to do is, is to have that, that support, but one of the things that, I, as far as bringing people back home, one of the things that I think is, is I encourage a lot of, and I was encouraged to do, so I would encourage other people to do, is when you get that leave when you come home, take time to, to reintegrate. Uh, spend time with your family, you know, take the, the, the time that you've accrued leave to go and don't just jump back into where you left off. And I had a, a very wise senior leader tell me, he said, hey, when you go home, don't try and pick up where you left off. You're going to have to create new. And, and some things did pick up, you know, I'm thankful that 
you know, my wife did such an amazing job while I was gone of keeping our home together and taking care of our children. And so when I came home, you know, there really wasn't a whole lot of struggle for her. She was just thankful I was there to finally start helping again. Right, right. Um, but not everybody experiences that. Some people try to pick up right where they left off or... Well, that would be a natural inclination. These guys are motivated. They're aggressive, usually guys. And so they want to get back and get back to work, right? That's right. And you're saying that might not be the best strategy. Absolutely, because you can end up, you know, because the, the world has turned without you. And that, that, that is one of the things that... It was so weird, at least for me in my experience, and I've talked to other people that experienced the same thing, that even though we knew we were gone for a long period of time, that it felt almost like a, like a, like a dream. And you come back home and you try to wake up to, to the normal world because you're back in your home, you're back in your bed, you're back with your creature comforts again, and it's tempting mentally to say, oh, that was just, that's back there. And you've got to start anew and say, okay, how do we pick up where we left off and, and reforge our relationships? And, and then you're going to have to live with the fact that you missed some things and you're going to have to rebuild relationships. And, and one of the hardest parts for, for people is when they lose things that they can't get back. You know, I had soldiers while we were gone that they had death of loved ones, and they were okay while we were over there. Um, or they, you know, they had you know, marriages that fell apart and relationships that imploded um, due to the distance and the struggle. And while they were busy and active, they could distract themselves. And when they came home, they've got to face the reality now that that person really is gone, that relationship really is gone. And what do you do now? And it can it can be very struggling because now you're also gone from your resource system. Right. That you know, especially as a, as a reservist, I said bye to people I may never see again for the rest of my life that I that I love like family. And so all of a sudden that, that support system is gone. And that's part of what I'm, I'm really hoping we can do here at Honey Lake is create a support Amen. system to say, how, how do we help people build those relationships again so that they can truly come home? We, we just did a recent study um, uh, in 40 countries and discovered that 36% of youth between the age of 13 and 17 um, had, had contemplated suicide in the last six months. Uh, uh, adolescents here in the United States, 36%. And, and then we went back around and said, okay, what are some ways that we can <clears throat> build resiliency against, against those type of thoughts? And we found three things. Uh, number one was sacred scripture. Those communities that had sacred scripture was, as Christians, th James, you know, this will be the first and only Christian behavioral health treatment center in the world specializing in our military personnel. You know, so number one, they, we, we, we understand that Jesus is, is the living word. He's, he's the holy scripture, right? Mm -hmm. Secondly was family, those people that were tied into family. And really, I'm sure when you're overseas like that, working with that unit, that, that becomes your family. Absolutely. And when you leave that family, that, that's traumatic in itself. I mean, when you're with those guys every day, do it, that becomes very comfortable. And third was uh, accountable community. Mm -hmm. So those, those last two are really part of who the military is. And so when, you've, when you're used to that, as you say, and you're disconnected, something that can reconnect, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, see, I see the program we're starting. We have, we have two programs. We have the 30-day program and we have the 60-day program. Right. And we're just believing God and praying that, um, you know, all, all, we're, we're holistic here at Honey Lake Clinic. We believe in all the latest medication. We believe in all the latest psychodynamic, uh, psychological interventions. Uh, we're at the cutting edge. Uh, we have a machine, as you know, called the TMS machine, transcranial magnetic stimulator, that is shown to ameliorate 72% of depression. We're, besides Boston University, we're the only behavioral health treatment that has that. It's about a half million dollar machine. But we are so excited to make this available to the military, all these. But we understand that, that the only one that can truly uh, transform the mind uh, or put the pieces of a broken heart back together is, is the Holy Spirit. And, and James, I just praise God for you today. Um, we couldn't have prayed somebody in better. Um, and so I'm just so excited about um, the Lord turning you loose and what he's going to do here at Honey Lake Clinic as we, you know, keep our hearts pure and our hands clean. And um, I'm just believing with you, James, that we're going to put together the best program. Uh, I'm hoping one day thousands upon thousands of, of these sacrificial men and women are going to find healing here at Honey Lake Clinic. Yes, healing for themselves, healing for their families, healings for their ministry. Uh, I believe God is going to call people here at Honey Lake Clinic, military guys, into the chaplaincy, into, in, into ministry. So we're so excited to have you here. Um, and uh, look forward to working for you. We'll, we'll get together again soon. Absolutely, yes, sir. Thanks, thanks Thank so you. much, James. God bless you, friends. I know you're as excited as, as I am. Please keep James and his family in your prayers as we put this program together. Pray for wisdom. And as 
the Holy Spirit goes out and calls people into the program. Uh, pray with us. We love you. God bless you. See you next time.